Welcome to the start of a brand new series that we are calling I Know That I Know. This title of this series for us really is a declaration. In fact, maybe if you're watching this today and you're sitting around a TV or you got your phone pulled out, your laptop up, and you're watching this at church online, you're watching on YouTube, maybe you're listening to this in the car, would you just declare this reality that I hope becomes just that, a reality for you throughout this series? Say, I know that I know. Come on, one more time with a little bit of faith. Say, I know that I know. Throughout this series, our intention, my hope for you is this, is that I want to help build your faith by establishing some things that you know. I want clarity to come to you. I want correctness to come to you and for it to be completely founded in the scripture. Because so often when we come to faith, when we come to following God, when we come to these things, a lot of it feels like hopes and dreams and airy things. But I believe we need some rocks. We need some principles. We need some truth that we know that no matter what's going on around me, no matter what other people say, I know that I know. And the way we're going to do that in this series is going to be, for those of you who are uh, regular with this, maybe a little bit unique. Each week in this series, when I come to preach, I'm going to be preaching from one simple verse. A simple verse that really is a, a foundational faith rock that I believe is significant for you to hold on to. I believe it's significant to you for you to grasp with all that is within you. And while I may touch on other verses like I will today, while I may use other portions of scripture to help you get it, to know it, it really will all each week come back to one theme, simple verse. And really, my heart in this series isn't just that you would hear me preach on a verse, but that you would be able to take it into your mind, take it into your heart, and to know it. It was the psalmist that said, I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? So that I won't sin against you. Some of you don't realize the fight that you're fighting with sin right now. Reason for some of you it's so strong is you ain't got none of his word in your heart to prevent you from sin. And if the word of God is like Paul teaches us, this, this life giving breathe on reality. When we take it in, it can and it will transform our whole lives when we know it. And when I say know it, here's what I mean. I mean when we memorize it. I mean when we understand it. And then ultimately when we believe it, it will literally transform our lives. Now there are some people in life, maybe you're one of these people, maybe you've met somebody like this before, who has a photographic memory. Do you know anybody like that? I tell you, I, I get frustrated by people who be like, yeah, like 11 and a half years ago, I was skimming through this book and on page 73, they made this very astute observation and they explain everything in like the greatest detail you've ever heard. And I'm like, that ain't fair. Cause some people are like that. Some people can just read something and they memorize it. Some of us, we read something and it's like, what did I just read? You know what I'm saying? But yet, of all the practices, of all the disciplines, of all the anything that a follower of Jesus could do that would strengthen your faith, that would grow your faith, that would transform your life, I honestly believe that memorizing the scripture is way, way, way up there when it comes to power in doing it, but it's often way, way down there in the practice of doing it. It's kind of like fasting, too. People don't want to fast. People don't like to talk about fasting, but fasting will transform your life. Memorizing scripture is so potent when you do it, because it has the power to get deep down inside of you so that wherever you go, it goes with you. And whatever you face, you're ready to face it with that on the inside of you. See, some of you don't realize that, that the fight that you fight is not a fight against flesh and blood. 
but it's against principalities and powers. And sometimes you need the truth of God's word on the inside of you that knows that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against him in judgment, he will condemn. That this is the heritage of his children. Sometimes you need to know that even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know that he is with me. That when you don't feel love, you know that nothing can separate you from his love. That heaven can and hell can. Our fears about today, our worries about tomorrow, nothing can. It gets on the inside of you. But scripture like that doesn't just like get downloaded to us. We don't just like, like have it an update run on our spiritual system and whoop, there it is. It don't work like that. You got to memorize. And so each week, somebody in that chat type each week, each week in this series, I'm going to preach one verse because I want you to understand it. And my prayer is that you would carry it with you through the week. That's why we've actually created some tools that are on our website at believing.church. And we've got some wallpapers for your phone, for your computer, for you to take this verse each week and have it before you. I know for me, memorizing can be a difficult thing. And what's always helped me whenever I'm trying to memorize something is, is seeing it over and over and over again. And I see it here and I see it there. And so sometimes trying to memorize things, just literally having it on the front of my phone helps me. And so that's my prayer for you. Maybe even one way for you to participate in this series is just say, hey, I'm going to put this scripture verse on, on my home screen, on my phone, like, like every single week. And I'm going to do everything I can to get God's word on the inside of me. And with that, let's get into this first verse. This first piece of truth that I pray will transform your life as you understand it. Memorize it and believe it. In other words, as you know it. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, will serve as our key scripture on today. This is the verse that I pray in a few moments when we are done with our time together. That you know that you know. Paul says it this way. He says, oddly enough, we know. He's making a declaration. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to read it one more time because that's the whole text. I ain't got a follow-up story. Or that's the whole of the text. One verse. One more time. Romans 8, 28. Maybe you would just read it aloud with me. That's like a memorization technique, too. You can just read it aloud with me wherever you at. It says, we know that all things work work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. This verse right here that we just read is one of the most sought after verses in the Bible for comfort in difficulty. Whenever people are facing difficulty, people of faith, people of not faith, people trying to be a good friend will often say something to the effect that they think harkens back to the ideas in this verse. Come on, all things work together. All things going to be good. Problem is, a lot of people, when they rehash it and rehearse it, when they speak it or try to draw back from it, they, um, they mess it up. See, the, the problem people run into, and I need you to understand what I got to correct so I can instruct. This verse, Romans 8, 28, is not a promise for everything to be good because of God. That's not what it says. Some people will lean into the thought of Romans 8, 28 and say, baby, if God is in it, it's going to be good. That's not what that says. Some people try to use this as comfort and say, God, you're going to make this good because with you, all things are good. That's not what this says, nor... Is it a call to alert if there is bad in your life that somehow you're outside of God and outside of his plan and outside of his will or his way if there's bad? Because with God, all things are good. That's not what it means. See, sometimes what folks say 
ain't what folks mean. And sometimes what folks say, it seems like it might mean a thing, but really it means something completely different. Now, I love Memphis. Come on, if you're watching this at Church Online, you know our Grizzlies have a big playoff game on today. We in that series with the Lakers, if you're a Laker fan. But uh, I love, I love Memphis. And I, I think we have a corner on the market when it comes to the, the best original commercials. I lived in Dallas. It's the only other city I've ever like lived in, aside from the greater Memphis area. But um, I lived in Dallas for almost nine years. Let me tell you, the local Dallas commercials ain't got nothing on Memphis commercials. I mean, our commercials are iconic. In fact, if you've lived here for a little while, I can just begin to talk about a commercial and it pops into your head. Am I right? Come on, if I say don't lose your head, use your head. Right? Come on, that commercial has become so iconic that that commercial did another commercial about itself. That's like a, that's like a world of, I don't, I don't know, all kind of something. But don't lose your head, use your head, man. Or if you're an old school Memphian, you would know that you got to get the dope out them veins and get some hope in them brains because you ain't ever going to get nowhere. Somebody type it in the chat. Smoking a pipe. Come on, come on. Our commercials are classic. The godfather of classic commercials in Memphis, in my opinion, is a gentleman by the name of Mark Goodfellow. Now, some of you may be familiar with Mark Goodfellow and his uh, It's All Good car dealership, where he's had this tagline for years and years and years in his commercials and all that, where he will say something to the effect of, I don't care about your credit, I care about you. It's classic, man. Some of the stuff I ain't seen or thought of in years and years and years, you hadn't either. But if you've been around here for a while, you've turned off. Like, it just has a way of, of blending into who you are. It's all good auto sales. Funny thing is um, about it's all good auto sales is if you end up finding yourself needing to buy a, a, a car from a place that says, I don't care about your credit, I care about you. Let me tell you what's not all good. Your credit, <laughs> or that car, <laughs> or, or, or the deal that was just handed to you. Like, like, maybe you got a car, maybe it will last this afternoon, or maybe you got a car, but you're having to pay 39% interest to have the car. Like, like, it ain't all good. We say what we don't mean. I appreciate it's all good as serving as uh, a theme for us on today because the title of this sermon is just that. It's all good because when you think of Romans 8, 28, that is, the, that is the message I want you to get. It's all good, but I don't want you to get it as maybe you hear it. I want you to get it as you will come to know it. In your notes, would you write this down on today? Because what... It's happening in Romans 8, 28. I want to begin to clarify before I begin to apply. In Romans 8, 28, God doesn't promise all things will be good to you. God does promise all things can be good for you. There's a massive difference in these things. Romans 8, 28 is not God's promise to you that all things will be good to you. That's not what it says. That's not what he means. That's not what the Apostle Paul in his writing is trying to communicate. What he is saying is that God does promise that all things can be good for you. Because some of you know that some of the best things that will ever happen for your development will not look good at the onset. Some of the people in your life that have, are, and will help you grow the most, you may not like when they come into your life. Because some of you, I say that, and you think back about a teacher, or you think back about a coach, 
Or you think back about an employer that you had, a boss that you had, a shift manager that you had. And, and at the beginning, you didn't like them because they seemed to be mean and they seemed to be messing with you all the time. And they seemed to be bothersome. And it was just kind of annoying dealing with them. And you were like, geez, man, why you got to be so harsh? And why you got to be so hard? And why you got to be like that? And you didn't like them on the beginning. But there was something that they saw in you. And even though they rubbed you the wrong way, they pulled something out of you that would not have come out of you. And even though they pushed you, they pushed you to greatness. Even though they challenged you and you didn't really like to be challenged, you didn't really like how it hurt. You didn't really like the additional rep. You didn't like having to handle that project even though you had another project because somebody else had dropped the ball. But it grew something on the inside of you that became for your good. Some of the situations that we find ourselves in on face value aren't good. Because you get sick. People you love get sick. You, you lose a job unexpectedly and your financial stability all of a sudden gets rocked. Like you thought you were going to get somewhere, but now it's like, ah. Oh. You, 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 you have issues with family, issues with friends, issues with a spouse. You have, you have betrayal that comes your way and you view it only as bad until now you start to look back and realize, you know what? I learned a lot about people from the people that stabbed me in my back. Jesus said to be soft as a dove, but also like wise as a snake. And I had forgotten that snake part until I kept getting stabbed in the back. And now, 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 now I've learned some things about how, and I'm stronger and I'm wiser. And I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody, but I'm glad it happened to me because it taught me something. I've heard people say my whole life, you know, we would be more creative. People love to talk this way in church. We would be more creative if we had more money. No, you wouldn't. You would be more expensive if you had more money. But creativity is often birthed out of necessity. Come on, some of the best meals you eat will not be with the fanciest ingredients. They will be with people who know how to create big flavor on a small budget. Come on, I'm talking about learning how to get good out of what doesn't appear good because God doesn't promise all things will be good to you. Not every person, every situation, every season or every predicament you find yourself in will be good to you. But God does promise that all of these can be good for you. See, we want God. This is what many of us want, maybe even you. We want God to make everything to our liking. But that has never been his plan or his priority. God is not your genie in a bottle, Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. Your wish is not his command. But Romans chapter 8 verse 28, our theme verse of today, tells us it's all good. Exactly. Because I must correct your approach to this verse in order for you to understand the implications of this verse. See, it's all good. Would you write this down in your notes today? Because as you memorize this, as you begin to quote this to yourself, as you begin to say this when you pray, you say this in situations, I need you to understand it's all good is not a promise. It's a perspective. We know, Paul says, all things work together for the good, those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's all good is not a promise that all things will be good. It's a perspective that whatever I see, whatever I face, it's all good. Because God never promised that everything in your life, everything that will come to your life, everything in my life would be good. All you have to do is actually read the scriptures and you see the stories of men and of women who some of them were able to say it's all good. Even though there is no logical or quantifiable way to look at what they were going through and call it good. The oldest book in the Bible, many scholars believe is the book of Job. Some of you are like, hang on, I thought the Bible started with Genesis. It does, and Genesis talks about creation, but Genesis was written by Moses. Many people believe that Job was written before that, as Job was possibly a contemporary of Abraham. And the story of Job is a, is a 
very foundational story to faith altogether. And for those of you that are unfamiliar, Job was, a, was an incredibly successful man, had a beautiful family, tons of resources, lots of people that worked for him. We would say he had, you know, he had companies on companies, and I mean, he was, he was doing very well in this life. He had tons of resources, tons of, like all of this stuff. But then all of it started being taken away. He started losing it all. Now, Job was a man of faith. And he had given God thanks and given God praise for everything that he had in his life. And he started losing things, but he didn't just lose. He lost everything. All of the people that worked for him, he lost. All of the resources, if you will, the money that he had, he lost. Even his children all died. And now Job, who in one scene, if you will, has everything, finds himself in the next scene of life with nothing. And Job's wife comes to Job. And finds him in a place where Job is still giving honor, still giving thanks to God. And Job's wife gets very frustrated with him. And she says, are you still trying to bless God? Why don't you curse God and die? It's Job's wife. And Job responds to his wife by saying, why are you now talking like a foolish woman? Should we only accept good from the hand of God? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. This is Job. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job understood that it's all good. It's not a promise, but a perspective. The writer of Romans 8 is a gentleman by the, man, by the name of Paul. Paul was an apostle who wrote 13 different writings that comprise 13 of the 27 New Testament writings. He wrote many other things, but these 13, 13 of his writings became books within the New Testament, one of them being the book of Romans. Paul also wrote several letters to a church that he started in a place called Corinth. And in what we call 2 Corinthians, Paul brings to light in great detail a little bit of what he's lived through to do what he does for God. He doesn't do this in all of his letters. In fact, many of his letters, he doesn't even hardly mention what's going on. But here he gets very vulnerable and he gets very honest and he starts telling the church in Corinth how hard he's worked. He said, y'all have no idea, but like night and day, like, like every waking hour I'm working. You think they work it, they don't even, I am working constantly. He talks about how he's been in prison many times how he's been beaten, and he actually describes a few different types of beatings he's received. He's like, I've been beaten with rods. I've received the 39 lashes. You see, they believed culturally that 40 lashes would kill a person, so they decided to make it law that you could give someone 39 lashes because they ought to, if they were in good health, live. And Paul talked about how he had received the 39 lashes multiple times because of his faith in God, because of his preaching the gospel, because of his following God. He had been shipwrecked. He had lived his life in constant danger. He was always looking over his shoulder, worried about where he was, worried about who was around him. He had been starving in many situations. He had spent many, many days and many, many nights freezing, it feels like, to death. He had gone without sleep. He had spent moments in his life naked. Was God with him then? Or was this his punishment for not doing? I thought you said it's all good. Was it all good? Yeah. It was. Romans chapter 5, also Paul's writing, just a little earlier from what our key verse is today, gives us a great understanding in the sequence of these things. It's written in verse 3 that we also rejoice in our affliction. I can think of a lot of reasons to throw a party. <laughs> Being afflicted ain't one of them. But what Paul says is we rejoice in our afflictions. Why do we rejoice in our afflictions? Because we know. Somebody in that chat type, we know. We know that affliction produces endurance. 
endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. Paul is saying we rejoice in affliction because we know that what starts as affliction has the potential to lead to hope. That the only way we actually develop the hope that we need, the hope that we want, the hope that God has for us, starts with this raw material called affliction. How do afflictions lead to hope? How do all things work together for good? Perspective. Because what affliction does is it develops muscle that can't be developed in any other place. It develops faith that can't be developed in any other place. And some of you, if you'd be honest, maybe you had a hard season, but you kept going through it. And now you look back and you see how strong you are and you see what you are facing and, and you give thanks to God for the strength on the inside of you. Endurance. You give thanks to God for the strength on the inside of you. People say you're generous, but you remember a day when you were stingy. People say you, 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 you're such a person of faith, but you remember when the slightest inconvenience used to knock you out. They say things about your character that you can't believe are even true, but you know where they came from, and they came from being faithful with affliction. See, the reason many people can't say it's all good is because you bailed when affliction hit and never let it become endurance. It's like they tell me with people who work out. I say tell me because I don't work out. <laughs> but a lot of people like the idea of being in shape. A lot of people like the idea of being strong. A lot of people like the idea of being toned. The problem is, is when it starts to hurt a little bit, they bail. When it starts to be harder than they expected, they quit. And they want the result. Everybody wants hope. Everybody wants to be a person full of hope. The problem is a lot of people aren't willing to get to hope through affliction. But Paul says that's how you get there because affliction, actually it produces endurance and you need some endurance to keep fighting and to keep trusting. And that endurance over time becomes attributed to your character. And once that character is seen of you, that character is said of you, all of a sudden you start to see what other people have seen. You're a person of hope. See, people of hope recognize that when I get to the other side of this season, I'm going to give thanks because the difficulty that I thought might take me out didn't take me out. But God was faithful with me through the waters. God was faithful with me through the storm. God was faithful with me in situations that I did not understand. And now I stand on the other side and I say, it's all good. Because I see what God has done in me through that. And they look at what's to come and they're not worried. They say, it's all good because God's going to build something in me through this. That's hope. But you got to understand, you don't get hope. You produce it. The scripture didn't say, this is how you receive. This is how hope is downloaded. Some of you think hope is a feeling or hope will show up. Or hope is a, woo, no. Hope is something you produce. Hopeful people aren't born, they're built. Because the kind of hopeful people I'm talking about are not just positive people. I'm talking about people who don't give up, who don't abandon ship, who don't uh, abort the task when it's in front of them. But they keep on pressing on. They keep on going, even though it's difficult all around. I'm talking about fighters. Because hear me, you will not see the growth you want through the situations that you want. But you will see the growth you want through the situations that you don't. It's that difficulty. It's that oppression. It's that tension. It's the fight called out in you that actually develops within you what it is you want. Hope. 
And hope says, you can write this down. Hope says it's all good, even when things aren't good. Hope has a way of saying it's all good, even when the situation that I'm in isn't good. Even when the the season of my life that I'm in doesn't feel good, it isn't pleasant, there are difficulties all around me, hope has a way of saying it's all good, even when things aren't good. See, how does that happen? What does that sound like? Can I tell you what I've seen in others throughout my life, throughout my time of following Jesus? People often years, decades in front of me who have faced far more because of the length of their life than I ever had, but they faced it following God. I've heard this phrase pop up over and over again. When you find somebody with cancer all in their body, but yet hope is what comes out of them. Or you find someone who continues to put God first in their finances, even though their finances have never been tighter at any moment in their life. You find someone who continues to serve God, even though physically they're drained and they're tired. I've heard the phrase, God is teaching me. God is teaching me. It's another way of saying, I don't fully understand what's going on yet. But I know that I know it's all good. I don't understand why they're sick. But God is teaching me that he is my healer. He is my physician. I don't understand. But God is teaching me. Hope says it's all good even when things aren't good. But what most people say, even people who would call themselves people of faith, is they would turn like Job's wife and lob accusation at God. God, if you were good, why does this happen to me? God, if you were in control, why do I have to deal with this? Not people with hope. Not people who know that they know. We don't say, God, why don't you fix this? But we say, God, I don't understand how you're going to use this yet, but I know you're going to use it because I know it's all good. It's all good because God hadn't left me. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you're with me. Hope says it's all good even when things aren't good. And hope also, would you write this down? Hope says it's all God, even when things are good. That's what hope does. Hope isn't just something that shows up in the difficulty. Hope presents itself, I think, loudest and greatest when things are good. Because many people have an easier time stewarding difficulty than they do prosperity. How does that look? We blame God for the bad, but we don't give him credit for the good. It's classic. God, why is this happening to me when it's bad? When it's good, man, aren't I strong? Aren't I smart? Man, I've worked so hard. Them folk got a, uh, got a hand-me-down kind of hope. Got this hope that somebody told them about, but they didn't really build themselves. Got a hand-me-down hope. Not a hope that they paid the price to have, but a hope that somebody sort of like, like just passed along to them. And they say, yeah, I'll hang on to that. But not a hope that they produced. Romans 8, 28. Come on, our theme verse on today. I know that I know all things work together for the good. It's a perspective. It's a perspective. It's a perspective. Somebody in the chat type that right now. It's a perspective. Somebody needs to just go ahead and tweet that right now. Don't even give people the context of what you said. Or maybe you put in a little comment that it's a a Bible verse. You put the Bible verse there, but you just need to share. It's a perspective. It's a perspective. Why is it a perspective? Because not everyone can see all things this way. Not everyone can see all things this way. We know. That all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to his purposes. 
God will use all things for your good if you love him. Which leads us to a question. So how do you love God? Because if it's a perspective that not everyone has, and the dividing line on this perspective will be you love God or you don't love God. These are not my thoughts. This is what Romans 8, 28 teaches us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit written down by the Apostle Paul. We know that all things work together for good. To those who love God, those called according to his purpose. So how do you love God? God. It's an interesting question because most of us spend our time wanting God to love us. God love me. God forgive me. God save me. God. And they're far less interested in how we go to love God. But the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5 verse 3 makes it very, very clear how we love God. In fact, he says it like this. This is love for God. Pretty clear, right? (laughs) This is love for God. To keep his commands. Everything I'm saying makes no sense if you don't love God enough to do what he says. Because it's a perspective that you take on and it's a perspective you can only have if you love God enough to do what he says, but it's a little more nuanced than that if I'm being honest with you. Because most of us, most of you probably listening to this podcast or watching at church online have some semblance of a love for God, don't you? I mean, you're here, leaning in, listening, watching, participating in some capacity after Easter. This isn't Easter, this is not the Southern show up, this is after Easter, there's something in you because of what God is doing in your life or you hope God to do in your life that you are here now. Here's the issue. The issue is you can have the it's all good perspective in one area of your life and not another area of your life. Because many of us choose to follow God, to love God in an a la carte fashion. I don't know if you've ever been to a restaurant serves things a la carte. When Mindy and I, my wife, we, were, we started dating in college. And I want to say it was for her birthday, the first time it had come around that we were dating. We were in college, and I wanted to take her somewhere really, really nice. And so I made reservations. We were living in Dallas. I was going to seminary. We were in college there. And uh, uh, I made reservations at this restaurant called Chamberlain's. Now, you can just tell by the name. Any, anytime it's just somebody's name possessive, you know it is expensive, <laughs> you know? And it was. It was this steakhouse. It was super well regarded at the time, just being, oh, like, unbelievable, right? And so I made reservations at this place called Chamberlain's, and we go in, and we, we don't fit because <laughs> we are two broke college students who rolled up in my Mazda B2500 stick shift green, and everybody else in there is in, like, Mercedes and Bentleys and all this kind of stuff. We don't fit, but I'm celebrating the one I love. You know what I'm saying? And we go in, and we sit down at our table, and we got our waiter, you know, and, you know, we're literally, like, 18 or 19 years old. And so, like, he is very disappointed that he has our table because we ain't drinking, and he knows we broke. You can just tell. Like, like we just, you can tell. It's like, them people's broke. I ain't getting tipped that well. But we're there to eat. And so we get to looking at the menu and looking at what to eat. I mean, it's a steakhouse, and I wanted steak. And everywhere in my life that I had been to get a steak, when you get a steak, I mean, you get, you get some stuff with it. You're getting, like, probably a baked potato. Probably like some like some green beans or some asparagus or some sort or you know some broccoli or something. You probably get a side salad. And at these prices, you for sure get a side salad. You may get a salad bar. Like I don't know. Where is that salad bar up in here? And so we go to ordering and Mindy orders, you know, I do the whole order, whatever you want. And then I'm gonna order my steak. And I order my steak. And I remember the waiter asking, he said, Is that it? And I said, Yeah, that's it. And then however many minutes later, Mindy's food comes and sits down, and then he lays in front of me this hot plate that he told me is very hot with this wonderful piece of beef on it, this steak cooked perfectly. 
And that's it. And I was like, he's like, is that everything? I said, sure, <laughs> you know, because I didn't know when I was broke. And I remember sitting there the whole night thinking, I only, I only have this steak. And it's great. But, like, it would have been nice to have some asparagus to go along with this or some mashed potatoes, some scalloped potato. You know what I'm saying? Like, a, a salad. Can I get a roll? Like, like, can I get something that goes with this? But what I did not realize about Chamberlain's until that moment is that everything was a la carte. You pick and you choose what you want. You don't just get it all. The only way to get it all is to take it all one by one. Some of you, you're following God. Your love for God is a la carte. And that is why there are some spaces, some places of your life, some seasons of your life that you can look at and say, it's all good. And there are others that you are filled with fear. There are some that you can look at and say, it's all good. But in others, you know that you bail because uh, the affliction that you feel in that area, you said it's too much. And so you can't see it's all good in this because you don't love God enough to do what he says in this. All things work together for the good of them who love God who are called according to his purpose. But if you have selected some area where you'll follow God, some area where you'll love God, and in turn, some area where you won't love God there, I won't trust God there. You won't experience the it's all good in the area you don't trust him in. See, you won't see all things working together for good if you won't seek to follow God in all things. Say, what does that look like? Some of you, you believe God is good and he is working in your future, but not in your family. And so it's very easy for you to say, my future is all good because my future is in the hands of God. My, I have been bought with the price. I know to be absent in this body is to be present with the Lord. I know that my steps are ordered by the Lord, so I trust him with my future. The problem is you don't trust him with your family. You have dysfunctional familial relationships. You, you, have, you have kids that you would rather helicopter over than to trust in the hands of the Almighty. You, you have brothers and sisters, uh, fiance, whatever you got, and you won't trust them. And that's why you live full of fear. That's why you live full of anxiety. That's why you feel beaten down by your family. You feel beaten down by your children. You feel beaten down by your spouse because you won't trust them into the hand of the Almighty. And so it's all good when I talk about my future, but it is not all good when I talk about my family. Or you say it's all good concerning your friendships because you put your friends in the hand of God, but it's not all good concerning your finances. Because you will give God praise and give God thanks for the people that he's brought into your life and realize that people will come and people will go and God has blessed you with them and you're thankful for them. But you won't trust God with your resources. And that's why you can say it's all good concerning the people that are in my life, but you don't say it's all good concerning the money in your life. And money is a constant stress and you constantly feel attacked in your finances. You're not attacked in your finances. You don't trust God with your finances. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I wrote this down in my notes. What you won't follow God with is what is preventing you from seeing it's all good. Because I say it's all good and you immediately push back. That's why. It's not because God does not have the ability to take whatever happens, whatever comes your way, and use it for your good. He is God and he can do it. The problem is there are areas that you won't trust him with. There are areas that you don't love him enough to follow his commands in, to do what he has purposed in. In those areas, you cannot see 
that it's all good. You can't. Because it's all good is not a promise. It's a perspective. And the ability to have that perspective rests with you. You can know that you know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's a perspective you can take on. But all things, write this down in your notes, will be for your good once you trust all your things to your God. All things will be for your good only once you trust all your things to your God. People who have submitted all of their life to the will and the way of God are the ones who say it's all good. And they have more and they have less, Paul, but they don't get overwhelmed. And people come into their life and people walk out of their life, but they say it's all good. And they have health in their body or sickness and they say it's all good. And they have money in their bank or not very much at all. But they say it's all good because, because I, am, I love God enough to do what he asked me to do. And so now I see life differently. I am one of those who recognize it's all good. I want you to know this. To know all things work together for good. Doesn't mean all things are good, but they will work together for the good of those who love God, who take his commands seriously enough to follow them fully. So this week, I pray you put this verse on your phone. This week, I pray you download the, the wallpaper and put it on your monitor, put it on your laptop so that you keep seeing these words. And when you see these words, I don't want you to see a message maybe you have thought or heard. I want you to see the truth of what God has spoken to you through this moment. But I also want to help you today to know how to grow in this, to know how to take your next step in this. You see, because most of us probably are those a la carte followers of Jesus. Where we've got some areas where we really do see it's all good. Because we don't trust our power, we don't trust our strength, we don't trust our ability. There we fully trust God. But then we've got some areas where we don't. And those are the areas that riddle us with fear and doubt and anxiety. Those are the areas that we know uh, like, like the affliction hits us and we bail. And we've never developed endurance in those areas. We want to. Can I tell you, following God in another area enables following God in another area. If you are the a la carte follower, what will move you into following God with every area of your life is following God in another area of your life. And today, I believe that's the challenge the Holy Spirit wants to rest in you even in this moment as I pray for you as we close. Some of you, the Spirit of God is speaking to you specifically about areas in your life, people in your life, situations in your life where you know you don't love God enough to do what he said do. But he's saying, trust me. I know it might feel hard for a minute, but you'll never see all things working together for your good until you trust me there. And trusting him there will help you trust him in a place that you couldn't imagine ever trusting him. And trusting him in the place that you could never imagine him trusting, you trusting him will help you trust him in another way. And you'll look up one day and not even recognize the person that you are because you're not riddled with fear. You're not riddled with anxiety. Difficulty comes, good comes, whether it's good or bad. Blessed be the name of the Lord because I know it's all good because it either will be good or God's going to use this for my good as I trust him with all things Father I love you thank you for your word today help us to be people who know that we know that you are with us that you are for us 
that you have not forgotten us. Father, I pray for people today who need to take steps of faith, steps that may feel difficult and even painful. Father, I pray you give them the boldness and the faith to do those things, to do hard things, to do difficult things for the honor of your great name. And God, I pray you help us all to see whatever we see. that It's all good because we know that we know. Jesus, I love you. Pray all this in your precious, powerful, and holy name. And everybody said, amen.